So hello and welcome to the Super League show. Uh, I'm again not Jake, but I am Mike Piven, the scrutineer, and I'm joined once again by Ben and Casper. Say hello, chaps. Hello. Hello. Well, hey, we're all here. So I, I'm feeling a bit more comfortable in the seat. It's getting my groove. It's my place now, Jake. You're going to kick me out next time you come back. I'm squatting at the moment. Um, but at the same time, we shall crack on because this is such a great series. Uh, we are talking everything Super League about the uh, Canadian GP round seven, um, which was just an incredible race, even from the off, before we'd even started getting going, really. Um, before we really get into all that, uh, there was a few driver changes and upgrades and bits and pieces that we need to go through that is unique to Super League. Um, so uh, ooh, who should we go with first? I'll tell you what. Casper, uh, can you run me through any changes in the uh, lineups this, this round? Well, first of all, we had the Jarl Tyen um, go, in, uh, go in at Bowders into Cherenko's car, which, to be fair, is not that surprising considering Cherenko's uh, performance this year. And then we also had Wopke in at Adonis again. It seems to be a fairly common sight uh, at this point. We also have uh, our Australian, uh, Benefield, back at Carinel. Uh, and we also had Klont in uh, Gagzilla. So, uh, sorry, Klont is the one that we would, we're seeing quite a lot of. Wopke is, uh, I'm not sure if, how many times we have seen him so uh, far this season. He's done, this is, that was his, this is his third round he's done now. So, uh, as a reserve boy moments, he can do four across the course of the season. Um, so that's the, not too surprising. But yeah, nice to see our time back. Um, he's a very quick driver. Uh, from previously, I uh, don't think we saw him until early last year, I think it was the last time we probably saw him in the league. So great to see people returning uh, in that way. Uh, on that sort of thing, last time out, we spoke about some potential driver changes and stuff. Any updates on that, Ben? Uh, well, what we sort of heard on the low is that, uh, obviously we know Philip Push is going to return at some point into Vobble in some shape or form. And currently we're expecting him to fill in for Tom Parker, uh, the VB reserve driver, and that will be at the Silverstone test session. Uh, obviously in Super League we have test sessions to gain uh, research points for the car, for all your developments and stuff. So Pushka should be covering in that. We don't know if he's going to do any races or anything. Um, I know he's still sort of in the rehabilitation phase from his... Uh, his illness so who we're looking to get up to speed and that's always a great place to start with a test session as for stefan Rao, obviously we mentioned that he is in talks uh with drive at norton but um we haven't really heard any more about that we were expecting something to show up for silverstone so hopefully in two weeks time we'll have a bit of a sort of clearer picture on that one yeah should be said of course he's still driving the super cup car uh, on the wednesdays as well yep. um so you can sort of see him there. I suppose if we see him stop doing that, we might get a hint that maybe he's doing Super League. Uh, yeah, uh, although that, um, yeah, that would pretty much mean that. Although you nearly want to, uh, you nearly see him still race in a uh, Super Cup for a while before, uh, even if he uh, moved to Nord. Uh, uh, we'll we'll probably hear about it before it happens anyway. Yeah, I mean, it depends what uh, contract he signs on at Norton as well, whether he uh, rocks up on a reserve or something, which would still allow him to do Super Cup for a bit longer. Maybe if it's sort of a bit like a trial or something at Nord Zone for a few races, but who knows? As I say, we'll see in the next few weeks uh, what happens there. Yeah, he could do four races, like we were saying, uh, like uh, Wook has done at Adonis. On contracts there, Ben, last time out we heard you being a little bit... Um, a dead. <laughs> Angry, maybe annoyed. I don't know how to <laughs> how, what your level of uh, of extremism is, yeah. but nonetheless, a uh, little bit controversial and not a lot's changed so far from last time two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I assume you're talking in response, obviously, to the storm contracts issue. I am, yes, yes, that's the one. Yes. Um, so, sort of last week, uh, we mentioned there hadn't really been any uh, action uh, on the. Uh, sort of storm contractual issues where they had three primaries and reserve signed at the same time, um, which was a breach of, and I can't remember the rule number now, but it's the contract cap rule, rule 7 point something, uh, where you're only allowed up to three primary or reserve drivers contract at one time. So clearly a rule's been broken. Um, when the penalties came out for Canada, there was no mention of it, and I did go and have a word with the head of DC to see you know, what was going on and there's been uh, plenty of discussion, but I haven't heard anything so far about it, um, which is, you know, it's a little annoying because you'd like it to be done, uh, obviously, for the next race, and it does have knock-on effects with other teams, 
for points as well. Uh, cough, slightly biased me. Um, so yeah, so I haven't heard too much about that, unfortunately. So we'll see. Well, I can give you a little bit of an update oh. um, from what I've been hearing. So, uh, you know, obviously I went and chased down some people as well. Yep. Um, the Yes, it did take a bit longer. It would appear that we're talking here a technicality that's off track, I suppose. So, uh, which hasn't quite been dealt with uh, in a manner, I suppose, um, directly. So, I suppose the first time always takes a little bit longer, but nonetheless. So, uh, from what I'm hearing, although it's not been announced by the DC or not been put out officially yet, I believe that they get, with it being a team issue, they're getting a, uh, basically the same penalty that uh, donors got for their breach of rules last year okay um which is effectively a hefty fine um what the exact amount is i don't know if it's uh, the adonis one wasn't disclosed last year mm. um but i believe it's it they definitely won't they it basically but the sounds of it is all the race winnings from the, at least the race i don't know exactly what the figure is um but that sort of technicality from a team point of view will hurt the team in a way that hasn't hindered the drivers who had lead yep technically a legal contract, but has harmed the team who have made the other. Um, so I don't know how you guys feel on that. I'll come back to you, Ben. I'll let you sink that in. Yeah. <laughs> Casper, on the other hand, do we think that's a reasonable you know, look at penalty? We are talking as real as it gets type of league here with Super League. It's yeah. the whole manager team effort as well as just the drivers. I honestly think that's fine. Um, it, it's an off-track uh, thing that happened you know, it was a dry. It wasn't exactly the driver's fault. It's not like if the drivers uh, manage the team in terms of the uh, yeah behind the scenes for the contracts, etc. So I'd say a fine <clears throat> is absolutely fine in my opinion. Dare I ask Ben? Yeah, I I I think a fine is acceptable. Um, what I would say though is it depends on the amount. That he's charged because if it's just race winnings for fifteenth, that's nothing to a team. Um, you know, it's not going to have any effect on them upgrading on dri- you know signing drivers. The, the I think the argument there with the value, if it, if it was just to say the fifth, the race winnings for that, is yeah. that actually it's almost irrelevant where he finished. He could have won it, or he could have come twentieth. It's the point that the team wasn't legal in how they set up to do that race. Agreed. My my problem there then is that. If it, again, it depends on how much the fine is. We we don't know. If it's a small fine, then what's stopping the big teams with a load of money just going right? Let's just sign as many drivers as possible because we know we're going to get a tiny fine that's not going to affect us. You know, in terms of overall budget. If it's a small team struggling for cash, then okay, it's it's going to well, hurt. But you argue that. But if you decide, if it, if one of the big t- for example, I've got you know, I like to call myself a big team, whether we are or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but if I sign driver up and they won the race. And we get fined heavily for it. That's a big penalty. Well, it depends. Is 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 the fine tied to the race winnings? That's that's the thing. Is it the, is it the, one the, set fine or the previous Adonis one was based on their winnings? Okay, that, that, that's if it's a sliding scale, then that's fair enough. Um, if it's a set fine, then I have a few issues with it. But if it's a sliding scale, then I, 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 bl- I believe I believe it is just a. It, well, although they haven't, announced, I believe it's going to be whatever race winnings a team. If it, it almost sets a precedent, really, that if there's a managerial uh, uh, technicality issue, I suppose, in some way, that's a team issue, the team loses all its winnings for that round, whatever that may be. You know, you come first and second, you end up losing, what is it, about. 1.7 million or something ridiculous. Yeah, okay, which is, which is sizable, isn't it? That's, that's a, an upgrade or possibly two, dependent on the size. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 that's I, I see that's fair. I see that's fair. It's, it's not... Yes, in this circumstance, if it might not actually be that much if that was the case, because, yes, he didn't get... The team itself didn't score many points, but they had two drivers there that could have done. Agreed, agreed. No, I, 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 that's fairer, I'd say, if it's done on a sliding scale. But we'll see. Anyway... We'll, we'll move on because that's we're all a bit. Con- it's, nothing's announced. That's just me fanning Space the flames a bit there, I suppose. Isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but right, just before we get into the race, I suppose there was a few. We had upgrades and engines and a little bit changed. A few less upgrades than sometimes um, because quite a lot upgraded for for Monaco. Um, but Ben, you fancy talking us through the upgrades that came came for this time? Yeah, there were uh, there were quite a few actually. Um, in ter- like 
I would have expected more, I'd say. Um, but obviously, as you say, a few upgraded for Monaco, which didn't really make much sense. We discussed that last time. But uh, we saw Red Archer bring some uh, weight and drag upgrades. Uh, Street Fighter brought a diffuser upgrade. Um, Storm with a rear wing downforce and diffuser upgrades. Uh, VBM spent quite a lot, actually, with a big front uh, wing downforce upgrade as well as uh, weights and diffuser and I think Woods um, brought a small front wing drag upgrade as well. Uh, uh, rear wing drag actually, but yes. Ah, rear wing drag. Okay, so the, the, graphic, the, the, the graphic I, I had done that, interestingly. Ah, fair enough. Okay. Um, and we also had two engine upgrades as well. So Trinity brought a 31% power upgrade to a big power upgrade we were expecting. Um, and, you know, it's quite sizable and uh, sort of needed in the Trinity engines. And Valiant added a bit more power as well, uh, which is for their ooh, five customers on the football manufacturer team. That's uh, quite a sizable portion of the grid getting a power boost ahead of what is a, an engine-dominated track. Yeah, I must say Martex did have their power upgrade as well, but they have been overtaken by Trinity going into this as the yeah. Trinity being the second uh, most upgraded engine as well. So we if you remember speaking last time, we Talos were the only ones that did upgrade for Monaco. Yes. So it's, it's you know, not quite as many as we'd have thought, really, for, for this event. I, I always imagined that Canada straight after Monaco is, right, bring all your upgrades to this event. But maybe not. Um, I suppose it made for quite a good good event, really, moving into qualifying. Um, so we, we didn't actually have a full grid going into qualifying. We'll probably come on to a bit of that later on, chaps. Um, but... But moving into the actual qualifying and what went on, there was before we even turned a wheel, we already knew this grid was going to be upside down because um, there was, to be honest, penalties galore for back of grids, which is kind of expected, I suppose, maybe coming out of Monaco that you'd end up with an awful lot of penalties. Um, and there was a bit of controversy even in, even in qualifying. Um, but nonetheless, we still we in the actual qualifying session, we did see uh, Mr. Lee Morris setting the timesheets alight um, and effectively sit getting a what would be in a pole position had he not had a penalty. We then also saw uh, Risto Capit just pip him, flowing Gaia to second and third. Uh, Rudy Van Buren in fourth uh, did his on the Super Softs, and Benz the Panic in the Kerno in fifth. Um, so where, where do we start with this? Because quite a lot, a lot of them also had back of the grid penalties as well. So anything come out of uh, come out of qualifying that really shocked you apart from the back of the grids, Casper? Uh, well, first of all, Geyer. <clears throat> Geyer's third place in qualifying was very big. It was quite a bit of a surprise, to be honest. He's uh, he's not been doing exactly great thus far, but uh, he has shown some good pace. And uh, again, with all the back of the grids, it's turned out to be uh, quite a good starting spot, to be honest. Uh, not surprised. Uh, well, I, I presume Rudy didn't even attempt to really push with the back of the grid, but it's still surprising to see him out of the top three, even without pushing. <laughs> um, and uh, surprising to, uh, to see that, yeah, Vodbull didn't actually get a top position, uh, at least before the penalty. Um, another one, well, Fran Lopez did decently, finally, in uh, qualifying again. And I guess those are the biggest ones. Anything for you, Ben, particularly? Guy being a big one at the top there and yeah not not a vobble on the front well on the timesheets didn't qualify first for the yeah second. i mean if you look at the timesheets credit to lee morris for breaking the uh the run of sort of vobble uh polls we had um you know good good lap there uh i wonder if van buren was maybe playing it a little safe trying to make sure he didn't get another cut track uh, and that's should be, why should be, should be said there van buren did his on the super softs everyone else did theirs on the ultras that is, that is true. Also, so, also Boldy was on the Super Soft. They're the only two to have run on the Super Soft. Okay, yep. So that, that um, well, that explains the, the the gap. Although, if Van Buren was to have qualified on Ultra Softs, yeah, he would have been pole probably by that gap. Four temps. I, could, I, I could think it would, see that would have been a lot time. closer, wouldn't it? I think yeah, that's the yeah. principle there is that, um, yes, I think a lot, we did see quite a lot of people playing Playing the longer game, maybe, with, with the strategy calls for back of the grids. Everyone seems to take it in different ways up and down the field. Um, you know, a lot of the top guys had the back of the grids. Exactly. I mean, you look for the penalty list. and uh, I mean, David Fyduk, uh Gogo Baldi, Lee Morris, Rudy Van Buren, Alex Cooper, 
Um, also, contact penalties for Roland, Morris, and McNaughton as well, plus many others. Uh, just an insane number of penalties. I, I'm, I'm quite surprised by the number of track cut penalties out of Monaco, but um, I know obviously we discussed it last time. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of penalties there, and that did sort of completely uh, turn the qualifying grid upside down. Yeah, I should say, your time was in on there as well with his from a good year ago yes. now, which is always nice. Nice to see that that's still <laughs> thought about and remembered. Uh, <laughs> the other the other one that I've, I noted down at the time was a bit more of his controversy, really, although he, he did a great job putting that car on what was effectively provisional pole. And then he had his back of the grid, and he was meant to have a five-place grid penalty as well. Now, initially, that was put in place, and they actually submitted an appeal during qualifying against that and so that then was not applied for this event okay uh, so he ended up so he still so it meant that rather than having his back of the grid and then dropping five places back behind the other back of the grid people he was then front of all the people that had the back of the grids because of his p1 time that he did set um now, to me, that's quite controversial in the timings and means that potentially, depending on the state of the appeal, we obviously know that's going through currently, so we wouldn't want to say. But if it was upheld, that would then roll over into Silverstone anyway. Um, do we think that's... Is that clever tactically? Is that playing the game? Or is that a bit of a stupid move if you end up having to take five places at the next race where you were at the back of this one anyway, Casper? Uh, yeah, in a way, but with... It, what I'm thinking is there are so there were so many people with back of the grid here that wouldn't that uh, I think that was nearly an advantage to like it was a nearly a, a smart move to nonetheless get that uh, try to get in front of them in whatever way you can and uh, especially with Rudy uh, being in the back as well behind you it's a it would be an advantage. Um, to maybe hopefully, uh, you know, Lee Morris would be one of the people who would be there, possibly still attempting to challenge Rudy. So, pos- uh, so maybe kind of try to what- do whatever he can to just be in front. Um, but then again, yes, next race he's going to suffer. As a, as a team owner, Ben, do we do we agree a good call? Um, strategically, I guess it's a good idea, especially if they think they have grounds for appeal. Um, you know, if they genuinely believe that they shouldn't have had this penalty, then it's a good move to get it suspended, you know, in effect, basically, and moved over to the next time, regardless of whatever, you know, whatever the outcome turns out to be. It does set a large precedent, though, um, as to what the appeal deadline is, I guess, um, for penalties, you know, allowing appeals all the way into basically the next race. Um, which can throw up, you know, confusion from other parties as well. Um, it's, it's it's interesting. I'll, I'll put it at that. I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree with it or not. Um, tactically, it's a good idea, especially if it gets removed. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree on that. Yes, there is a few things that I think the league maybe needs to look at in, in the respect of uh, mm. timings of these things. Um because I'd argue if they thought it was a genuine appeal, you'd probably have appealed it pre-doing qualifying. But maybe that's me being cynical. Or... Well, of course, it, it also depends when the penalties came out. Um, yes, sometimes they can be of course uh, rather of late. So, you know, if, if it was literally like two hours between, then maybe that's the first chance they got to see they had they were being given a five-place penalty, and naturally they would have gone, right, want to appeal that. You know. Very true. Well, we shall see the outcome of such appeal, and if we have a grid penalty for Morris next time out, uh, you guys will obviously be the first to know, and I'm sure we'll uh, see how that impacts uh, the next round in Silverstone. But we then got our grid. Um, we moved straight into the race uh, after the small controversies there. We've already had enough controversy, and we haven't even turned a wheel in anger yet in the race. <laughs> um, so we moved on, and there's there's quite a lot of talking points here. Um but, and some of them we've gone through before, to be honest, even with just me last time. I'm sure you've even spoken about some of these people um, in previous events as well. Um, it must be said the actual, there's, how to how to put this <laughs> to be nice, but at the same time. Yeah. Um, there's there's some uh, controversial driving standards, I would questionable, say. Up, yeah. Questionable, yes, thank you, that's a nicer word. Questionable driving standards 
up and down the grid. There is some very good driving standards as well from some people. But I think when you do have so many of what we'd, I'd probably say that, you know, at the top drivers, the top stand, people in the standings currently at the back, you do run the risk of going, them coming a cropper with some of these people that maybe aren't quite used to it or are quite new to the cars, or maybe some of them have even been thrown in last minute. Um, was it inevitable in that respect, or are we seeing, uh, you know, everyone going well? Actually, I've I'm suddenly got myself a high grid position. I'm going to defend like mad, and I'm going to really make sure I get, try and get some points out of this. Is it is it not clever to try and battle some of these guys, or is that just racing? At the end of the day, you can defend your position. You know, maybe some of these guys at the back thought they'd have a breeze getting past. Um, you know, it can be you can you can be a bit um, a bit like that as well. Uh, do we think it was that way, Ben, or were we just seeing a few poor decisions from drivers? I think it was a mixture of both. I think it was always going to be exciting, in inverted commas, um, having the grid so topsy-turvy, you know, the likes of Van Buren, and Fyduk, Baldy at the back, having to basically charge through the field um, whilst thinking about, you know, their tyre strategies, trying to race all the top guys around them and trying to get through some of the, you know, not-so-fast people in the field. It was always going to create excitement and, and again I, I have to stress that in a in a weird way because there was definitely some questionable driving from certain people you know there's some pretty poor defensive moves trying to stop the fast guys coming through um, Lopez was one I noted who was making some not not very good moves in like braking zones uh, Menoclon again really aggressive trying to stop faster drivers coming through um, you know, it was. I, I think it was just an anomaly, the the bad driving because of the way the grid was, and sort of had the nature of the race that was sort of going to happen, and I don't think it's something we'll we'll see as bad later on, but um, definitely some drivers do need to sort of look at the way they drove and have a good sort of think about you know how that race played out. You you mentioned Clunt there. I'm kind of amazed that he even got to the end of the race. If I'm honest, I don't know what was mm. keeping that car together. I think we saw him. Uh, I think he touched wheels with Fidek. He had an incident with Howell. He was nearly hit uh, Hins on a rejoin. He had an incident with Van Buren. This is like four by this point, I think. I mean, it's like it, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of incredible um, to see what went on. But it, maybe he was just bad luck, and I happened to be seeing him. But, but it was we did see quite a bit. Like you said, Lopez was there. Bold. He had a few incidents. We saw uh, Howell had a few. Right, Kilt did a few forceful ones. Franchik as well did some very good ones. But at the same time, was a bit iffy and aggressive in others. Roland again. I mean, that's uh, yeah. Spider, yeah, which yeah. to be honest, probably impacted his race quite heavily. He had damage for the whole race from turn one on lap one. I mean. How demoralising that is to try. Roland really disappointed me, to be honest, because that's two races now where he's completely misjudged turn one. You know, it's, it's, it's almost as if he hadn't really bothered braking and just hit the guy in front, and just like mm. um, his, you know, his turn one at Monaco was beyond awful, and same here at Montreal. Um, and it's a shame because it's it's starting to hinder other people's races. Obviously, Fidek had to do a lot of the race with rear damage, and that's in these cars that are so sensitive. You know, to suspension and to aerodynamics, that that can completely ruin a race. And yeah, I think Roland really needs to improve, um, or you know, penalties need to get stronger on him because that's two races now where he's really messed up. Um, going back to Clont, in fairness, not all of the troubles were his own fault. Um, the incident between him and Horro, I'd say, was more Horro's fault. Just seemed to push him off track. But then Menno did have quite a nasty rejoin. Um, where he sort of just joined the track at turn five almost flat out and um, poor old Thomas Hintz saw that quite late and uh, in uh, avoidance had to dive straight onto the grass um, and it all got a bit messy really um, mm. yeah a lot, lot of mess to drive now I must say that was, a, that was an interesting uh, interesting corner actually of the track in general with the barrier where it was you could actually drive around the back of the barrier <laughs> yes. and rejoin afterwards, which meant no one could possibly see you because you're behind a barrier, and then rejoin in the track, effectively almost in the braking zone for the corner. Um, it, I mean, Casper, was that, was that really inevitable at some point was going to happen? I'm amazed both cars got round there, really, without hitting the outside wall. It was a bit Fred and I have a needle on the grass. Um, do we think that was, I mean, I quite, you know, well done to Thomas Hins for actually avoiding it, I suppose. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it definitely, uh, I don't know, with a corner like that, it just sets up for a, an absolute disaster. Um, I, I think there's a reason why, why things like that don't exist on real-life racetracks. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we should maybe reconsider uh, putting some barriers there. <laughs> But then, um, I'm, I'm, obviously, I'm, we, we have to remember, sorry to jump in, but we are sort of limited in what content there is for the platform. And sure. if that is the version of Montreal that is the best for Rafat 2, then, okay, we sort of have to deal with it, you know? It's, we Arguably, don't... the version is very good. Oh, I mean, don't, yeah. I actually, it's, it's, and maybe it might be that that's there because there's a glitch in the wall behind it. We never saw that because the barrier was there. I don't know. Yeah, um, um, but the rest of it was fantastic. Exactly. Um, you know, as, as a track, mostly, it's, it's really good. Okay, maybe that's something you can look at next year. Um, now that we've seen the issue, we can fix it for next year. Yeah, no, I, as I said, it's just one of those things where you can look at it and maybe for next time you should put a barrier there. It's It shouldn't be the most difficult thing that has happened in track modding. But... Uh, but generally, yeah, no, the, it, it just seems like a very, very dangerous corner that you just can't... Uh, yeah, uh, and a lot of times when we've seen cars in there, it was already after contact, like uh, right uh, after his contact in with a wall, mm. and he just, you know, sometimes you just can't turn because it's such a fast corner, and when you have no front wing, you just, yeah. I'm just straight off, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great section to drive as a driver, as in terms of a race with the wall so close, it does go very sort of street circuit style, and sometimes that's not always best for the quality of racing. Well, it is a street circuit. <laughs> but true, yeah. We, we did see some good driving, though. I mean, don't get, oh, we've been yeah. very negative there, and there was quite a lot <laughs> of negative driving. I mean, don't get me wrong. But we did see some very good stuff as well, some particularly nice overtakes. I mean, I, I remember being enthralled with the Morris Boldy franchit Lopez battle for, for third or fourth at that time. I think it was quite early on in the race. Um, yeah, it ended up a bit nasty towards the end, but actually the rest of it was going on for two or three laps, and then there was a brilliant double overtake. I remember seeing Risto do on Lopez and Kilk, and Kilk did Fiduck as well. There was some really, really nice work out there. It does lend itself this sort of track with DRS and stuff into that final chicane as well. Um, is there anything that particularly caught your eye, maybe Ben? Or it, I mean, uh, that four car battle of Morris Valley, French and Lopez before it started getting messy was a really good battle, to be honest. Um, and the constant sort of, you know, slipstreaming, DRS, switching positions every, you know, f- few corners, you know, is really good to watch. Um, it's just a shame it's all sort of got a bit heated and there's a bit of contact. And uh, I remember Lopez having to dive over the last uh, chicane anti-cuts and sort of sprung in the air a bit. Um, Risto's move on Lopez and Kilk uh, was actually really good. Uh, the problem was it was distracted by uh, uh, seeing sort of Lopez force Kilk into the grass a little bit, but Risto's actual move there was absolutely brilliant and a great double overtake. Uh, and of course, Kilk and Fido was another uh, really good move. And you're right, there was some really good racing. It's just a shame it was sort of marred a little bit by, by some of the other standards. Yeah, and I think that... Well, I mean, there's always going to be that in some, some leagues yeah. anyway. You do end up with that. And like you say, Casper, being a street circuit, um, I, you know, but we saw at Monaco actually it wasn't quite as much of this, so I was quite surprised. So maybe they all saved it for Canada. You know, <laughs> we, we had all the fun here instead. Less downforce. <laughs> yeah, there was. I mean, the top speeds here are just you know, it's crazy. Some some of the speeds that you can get, like we said, with all the powerful engines and everything else, it was immense. Um, but getting into the so that was all our sort of standards and everything. But actually getting into the race itself, we ultimately we actually saw some amazing drives. I mean, now I know we've we've said it every time we've been in every event. Rudy Van Buren. I mean, is there anything this guy can't do? Like, all right, he didn't get pole. We've, we've accounted that. He can't do that. He can't get pole on super socks against Morris and Ultras on a track like this. Other than that, starting from the back, you know, he comes out and wins this Grand Prix. We end up with Rudy Van Buren winning, with Guy in second, Cap at third, Boldy fourth, and Fiedig in fifth. Now, to come all the way from the back of the grid and win it, granted by a couple of seconds, um, I... I just incredible, particularly, and he even had contact with Klont on lap three. It's just incredible. Yeah, I, I mean, if this guy doesn't win the uh, championship early, I will be amazed. It's going to take something crazy to change because Van Buren's just on a roll now. Um, yeah, just coming from the back of the grid, he got his strategy nailed. The car was as ever stupidly fast. Um, 
and even he got sort of tapped into a half spin on flat three when uh, he decided to try and make it three wide into turn one. I don't think Klont saw him uh, on the outside, cut across and uh, just clipped Van Buren's uh, nose and spun him. But even then, drove a great race and he did, he did have to work for the victory this time. Obviously, had to surge through the fields and uh, he managed to catch up to Gaia who was, you know, a substantial amount uh in the lead, really, over Capit. Um, but and they got strategy nailed and uh, got a great win out of it. Yeah, I mean, Casper, I, I was so. I, I mean, obviously, I had a bit of vested interest, but Just I was on. Yeah, well, a little bit. <laughs> you may have heard, but yeah. <laughs> but I was so enthralled that last, like, what was 10, 15 laps it was incredible to watch. Would he catch up? Wouldn't he catch up? And then knowing that the tyres will also fall off later on, it was. It, was like, and would then Gaia catch up? It was such a cat and mouse sort of. Will they? Won't they? Because um, then they had had a bit of a bout, you know, a few laps earlier, and really hadn't been able to get past. Um, did you enjoy it as much as me, Casper? Oh, it was very, very good. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, a battle for the lead is always interesting, and when you have two of, uh, let's say, uh, let's be honest, great drivers out there, uh, battling for the lead like that, and. Uh, we have seen that Rudy Hiller struggle at first to overtake, so it was really, really tense at the end whether he will be able to do it or not before the overtake itself. So, yeah, it was exciting. On that, like, Gaia did an amazing drive. To me, oh, he did. I, I think he was fantastic. Um, you know, we have, I think, well, I say we, you guys particularly have been a little bit... Um, uh, not unfair to him. I think I think by his reckoning, he's probably not having a great season, really. But he has now got himself two second places this year, um, which is pretty good. And it's so close. I mean, he's two seconds off the win there. That must be heartbreaking, really, um, after such an effort there. To be to be 20 seconds ahead of Risto, it's pretty good going, considering recent events. Um, I was very impressed with him. And, and Norgen, I mean, fired it, got himself up to fifth as well, like I said, with that damage and the back of the grid. So he did a pretty good effort as well. Um including the ultras. So actually, they did very different strategies. We've seen previously that Norgen have both gone the same strategy yeah. all the way. Whereas this time out, Gaia sort of went the whole super soft, super soft, well, ultras start with and then super soft synth. Whereas Fidel went ultras all the way until we had to do a super soft synth at the end. He was, he was getting those ultras lasting so many laps more. It was almost reminiscent of when we've seen Rudy in previous races getting them to last. I don't know whether it was anything to do with any damage he had on the car that somehow wasn't wearing these tyres, but he did the great job. He did very well with tyres in Monaco, it must be said, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's the only person that would have done the ultras like that, reminiscent of like a Hins in Austria, I want to say. Yep, yep Austria. Um, that, sort of, that sort of event. I was I was massively impressed with that, really, to get up to fifth. Um, and It shocked me. As a team owner in the pit wall, I was going, what is this guy doing? There's no way he can... I was expecting <laughs> him to pit any minute. Going, I, I was literally saying to my guys, yeah, he's pitting in a minute. He hasn't come in. He's pitting next lap. <laughs> he hasn't come in. He's pitting again. Okay, he's not. We'll just, I'll just tell you when he comes in. So, I mean, uh, that shocked me. Did it surprise you, Ben? Yeah, I mean, Nordson have always been strong on tyres. And we saw this last year. They did loads of tyre work over the 2016 summer break. And after that, they were saving themselves a pit stop compared to everybody else because they knew how the tyres worked. And it seems they've done the same this year. They've carried over yeah. a lot of that knowledge. And we're seeing it now. Gaia, P2... And to, okay, he was only two seconds off, and that must, you know, that's rather painful. But considering how badly Monaco went, this is brilliant. And hopefully, he can take this momentum and push forward, and we can have a really great battle at the front. And, and finally, as well, to come through from, well, he started 16th in the end after all the penalties. P5, brilliant showing as well. Okay, maybe taking ultra shots every stop may have not been the best strategy, but then he, he only did five pit stops compared to. You know, Sam Lee Morris, who did seven, um, <laughs> Franchic six, uh, Wright Kilk six, and they were using more super soft. So, you know, great, great performance from both. Um, and that's helping them in the team championship as well. You know, solidifying that P2. They just need now that final bit to try and catch up to Van Buren and football and give it a real uh, challenge to the title. Because as much as Van Buren seems to be running away with it, there's still chance this can change. If Norgen can find out where they're losing that just little bit, then we can have a really good battle for the title. 
it should be said for this event actually that member of Oddball had their upgrades and Norgen didn't this time. We'll see the opposite of Silverstone, so that'll be interesting. That makes it even uh, more interesting, doesn't it? If they're only two seconds off and Vobble had an upgrade and Norgen had turned up to Silverstone, which is still quite a power intensive track yeah. with an upgrade, then well, that's going to be really interesting. Also, arguably, um, last season, one of the more, uh, the Norton cars really only became really impressive, as I said, after the uh, summer break. So I, I recall one of the biggest kind of jaw droppers of a race where it was uh, Italy, Monza, where they, I think they managed to, Geyer managed to win the race by just driving on basically medium tires or something like that. The hard, uh, basic tires that no one, and no one else touched, but they managed to make them last and do one or two less pit stops yeah. and somehow win the race, even though everyone thought the tire is useless. So I wouldn't be surprised this, if they do something like that again later this that, season. That's a very good point, Casper. But if anyone hasn't watched that race, Monza last year, go back on the GPVWC YouTube or something and watch it. Absolutely incredible. Crackers. I mean, yeah. it was, what was it? I, finished? I think he won it by, what, 0.2 of a second or something ridiculous yeah. at the end of the race? Something it was like unbelievable. That. I actually commentated that, so enjoy that if you want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> if you love Casper's tones, you can listen to him on Monza last year. <laughs> Speaking to you, though, Casper, did, there was one guy, though, that, yeah, he finished third, cap it. He started on pole because of Morris's back of the grid. Was this his best chance to win? And we saw, we, we saw him hit the wall in lap two while leading. Did, did he throw this away at the end of the day? Or was Guy and Van Buren just that much better? Uh, I think it has a lot to do with it. Uh, definitely a contact will not help. And possibly if he managed to keep, uh, keep it going, considering how close the at the end Geyer was uh, and really where, uh, considering how fast that Vodbull is, uh, I think Kappa did throw it away. But it, he, it could have been, not would have been kind of a thing. It, it was a very much... On the table, but didn't have to happen if he didn't hit that wall. I, th I think one of the telling moments that I thought, well, after having hit the wall, he obviously dropped down into second. After their first pit stop, Gaia came out into clean air, and Risto ended up stuck behind Baldy on different strategy. Mm. I think that just just shows just that how much impact, even within the space of about ten laps, that just that one what was quite a small error, only lost a few seconds out of it actually loses you shed loads of time across the whole race. It, it's unbelievable, really, how much these, these things make a massive difference. Um, but to end up, you know, 20 seconds back, granted, towards the end, probably wasn't pushing as much, knowing how far behind, you know, it's not catchable after the last few laps. Um, do we think he'll have this option again? To, to do, You know, is he going to ever, ever have a better chance than that to win a race bet? No. I, I think this was his best chance to win, given... We've seen the pace deficit to Van Buren. Um, unless, obviously, Kappa can surprise us, pull something out the bag. Um, you know, maybe he'll be able to match Van Buren on pace, in which case he's got a lot better chance. But at the moment, from where we're seeing, when Van Buren doesn't have a penalty, he is faster than Kappa and will out-qualify Kappa and then be in front. Um, and it's, it's hard to see what Kappa can do, really. Um... Yeah, it's 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 a tough one. It's a shame because Capit last year in Supercup was insanely fast. He was the, the oh. man to beat, and this year he's sort of getting a bit overshadowed, really. Well, yeah, I think well, yeah, we've spoken about this before. I think he, you know, in many other teams, he'd be the father number one driver. It's it's just unfortunate in the Bob Ball, he's got a very capable teammate there. You know, we, we're talking about the Masters and World GT title holder here <laughs> you yeah. know this is no no slow coach is oh, it no not at all I mean, I mean p3 is a brilliant result you know it's it's not something to to scoff at but the problem is when your teammate is constantly out there winning was it five in a four or five in a row now um the four yeah, in a row he's done in a row. Which, yeah. which actually is uh, might as well highlight it that is actually the first time that's been done in the rfat two era yes we mentioned that last week didn't we so that is a brilliant achievement but when your teammate is doing that um and the, we know the car is good enough to be winning. It seems to be just falling back on the driver now. So, who knows? I'm sure Capit can surprise us. I'm, I'm sure he'll be able to find that time over the next few races and um, hope to get up there. But I, I think this was probably his best opportunity for a, for a good while. Talking to somebody who might well have thrown away a victory, potentially, to put it mildly, um, Lee Morris. Now, the guy obviously had the pace because he put his car first in qualifying. 
he ends up at the back of the grid. He doesn't take the extra five places because he doesn't appeal. So he ends up front of the back of the grid runners. He's arguably quick. He ends up sixth behind people like Fidek and Boldy, Capit, Guy, all these sort of guys. But that's not really just the the uh, be all and end all of this race. The guy did uh, so many. He did so many trips to the pits. It was unbelievable. The, he had he had a stop and go and two drive throughs for speeding. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Have you, Casper? <laughs> no, not really. It's that's. Uh, having so many penalties in a race and especially with speeding and yeah this is extraordinarily well not it, it seems like a rookie mistake nearly at that point it's not but, something you'd expect from him is it um, a guy no. who's been racing in super league since what 2010 2011 Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah and all and honestly it's so disappointing as well he has the pace to keep up but then again, we have always seen from races that he is a lot quicker in qualifying than the race itself, or one supporter, uh, at least compared to Rudy, for example. But in the end, he is very, very quick regardless. But it, it also seems, yeah, he's, he wouldn't be the best in the tires either. Again, and then again, his car is not exactly up to spec, is it? Well, we say, we say that on the upgrades, but then if he qualifies first... Are they making that much of a difference, or is Lee just pulling that car out? That I don't know. Yeah. That, you know, we don't. I don't think there's as much difference in the cars this year as there has been in some years. Yeah, but if, even if there is a small difference um, that you don't really see in qualifying, a small difference over a large period of laps and a large period of time averages to a lot bigger of a gap than you might think. I th that's a fair point. I think over one lap, Morris can get that pace out and be as fast and faster than Van Buren, but. When you start factoring in the lack of upgrades and across a whole race distance, so it's going to start affecting tyre wear if you have less aero grip and mechanical grip, um, things like that. It's the, the time differential will get bigger over that, that race period, and maybe that's why we can't see him matching the likes of the Rob Balls and the, the Nordsons and to an extent the Bouters as well. Do we think then that maybe... Because I can only imagine if you drive through and end up with a penalty for speeding the pit lane, how annoyed you'd be at yourself to then do it again. And then do you start putting blame? If your car's not up to the standard as well, I, and let's be frank here, Lee Morris has only finished the season once. He's, he does get, um, he's quite a temperamental driver, shall we say. Is, uh, you know, what's, where, what stage do you get to where you think this, this team and this car isn't for me? Casper, do you think there's ever going to be a point this season where he might call it or look to somewhere else next season? At the point wherever he sees that the car is just not doing it for him. Uh, I, I think so far you can see it, at least in qualifying, the car has space, so he still may, and he still can pull some uh, podiums out of it whenever he, he doesn't have a bug. But uh, I think as soon as he sees that these guys can't even do that, can't even do well in qualifying, I think, or can't just cannot pull the podium even if he tries his best, I think that that's the point of breaking. Well, well, let's let's hold on a minute because he is P two in the standings. Yeah, um, it's it's not like he's done badly and the car's that far off. Um, okay, we 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 do say over race distance we think it's slower. You know, he's still P2 in the standings. That's nothing to be disappointed with, given it's you know, oh, Morris's well, first proper return in years to do a full, well, what we think will be a full Super League campaign. So I, I, I don't think he'll, I don't think he'll leave the season. I think he'll stick with Madcape, even if their rate of development completely slows from its slow crawl uh, uh, to, to nothing. But. I think honestly, it just depends on how much it will affect them by the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. We we, we have seen teams, of course, as a first year team, Bad Cape. This is a, to be honest, developing slowly is a completely legitimate strategy for a new team to save you points for the second season, which we've always seen has been for most teams the make or break season for that team. There's there's only ever been one team I think that's come in first season and really gone for it. Everyone else has taken the first season to get a solid points place and then go for a title the second season so it could be legitimate and you know if Lee's on board with that then that's absolutely fantastic there has yeah. been some other teams as well um, I remember we're quickly moving on there because I know I've spent an awful lot of time on that uh, <laughs> the Red Archers carried on with their double points scoring 
you know, consistently doing well with a with a ninth and tenth there. Uh, they can, you know, we've said the last few races they've been a good solid points team. They're you know slowly moving up the standings as well with it. I'm I'm quite impressed with how that team is working, Ben. Yeah, really good performances there. Um, Red Archer have looked really good the last few races. Um, you know, good double points finish. Uh, and if they can keep that up, they're going to start moving up the standings. I've, I've, we've had nothing but praise, really, for Thomas Hintz over the last few races. He's been doing brilliantly, even against his own uh, emissions. And Kilk's been pretty strong the last few races he's come in. Um, so, yeah, hopefully they can keep the momentum going, keep picking up those points, and that will put them in a really good position. Kilk particularly has that, has some serious pace over a lap or two. Like... He's right up there with some of the top guys when he really goes for it. It just seems to be... He's quite new to this, I suppose, so the long lengths and close racing, I suppose, maybe not quite... Uh, it's not his specialty yet, but I can really see him potentially getting quite far up that, that grid over the next few races, Casper. Yeah, no, it, it definitely. Like, with the... Just with how they're doing, I think... Well, with uh, how Hens is doing, especially, I, I think it's... Well, although Hint, with Hintz, it's he's very good in the races and not in qualifying, which maybe in qualifying he can be a bit further back. So that's his downside. But he will definitely be moving up in, in the standings for sure. Uh, other couple of people to note before we look on to people that haven't done quite so well. Wants to give a good shout out there to Sapanic in the Kerno. He was sort yep. of there or thereabouts all, all weekend, really. He qualified quite high up. He was mixing out with everybody, finishing seventh. You know, you're not that far off Lee Morris on the lead lap as well, which is, you know, no small feat this season. Uh, and Franchik as well. He mixed it up with an awful lot of people in the Street Fighter and finished eighth. I mean, they're, that's some good points finishes for that team, those teams even, sorry, the Kerno and the Street Fighter. Uh, I just wanted to give them a little shout out before we move on to some people that are maybe not quite so good at Canada. Um, should we start off with someone that did sort of make all the, made my show this week near quite interesting anyway, Hawkeye. So we're talking teams before with Storm and issues that go on behind the scenes. Hawkeye, let's be honest, they made a big boo-boo out of this. Uh, yeah. Somewhere on the line, they forgot to select some fresh engines. So all, they came all the way to Canada and they, oh, we've got the same engine and we used it at Monaco. So this engine, both the cars had by far the lowest percentage engine we've seen all event. Cooper started with 8 and uh, Olsen with 14. Uh, it was always going to be a debate whether they got to the end or not. Um, and surprise, surprise, Casper, they didn't. Well, um, I think with us knowing that it's about 30% per race, um, <laughs> it was, uh, I don't think it was a surprise at all. And, uh, and to be fair, oh, uh, yeah, it must have been such a, just a mistake because this track is also so heavy on the engine. It's such a power track. It, oh, just a big boo-boo. It was like they were powered by Honda for a race, wasn't it? It was a uh, double engine. No, failure. no. Ben, uh, we must admit that they did get further than Honda. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that is true. Um, but it's just it's such an embarrassing mistake from a team that's been in Super League for years. It's not as if they didn't know they had to pick engines. Um, it's, Instinct, yeah. Street Fighter did the same thing. They made the same error. Their At engines least, were yeah. better off, so they got away with it using a f something like a forty and a thirty something engine. They got away with it. They got lucky, and a P eight with a worn engine from David Francic, given seventeen, has brought fresh engines. It's pretty good. I'll take that. Um, but no, Hawkeye is it's just such a rookie error, and it's just not something we expect to see from a team uh, who's been in for so long. So, yeah, not 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 a good move. Not good. Not good. I I do find it ironic that Whoopi manages Hawkeye. Gave them poor engines, but sat in an Adonis with a fresh engine in the back of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. That is very um, true. At, at, of, you know, from the same supplier, you just think, just take mine. Just take this one. <laughs> I'll have it. Like, but yeah, that's, that's a bit of a shame for them. And I thought, probably rubbed it in a little bit. I, I wouldn't want to have been in that team meeting after Canada. No. Um, or in fact, pre-Canada would probably have been more yeah. awkward. <laughs> um, I think, but fair play to them. You know, they turned up, you know, Cooper still did the 21 laps that before that engine collapsed. Same with Olsen. They both gave it a good go. Um, must said they are the engine manufacturer as well, so it's not like they're a customer team here. So they've, they've made a massive mistake there, but they have they will have a nice... They've used that engine now four times. So effectively, they've got a fresh engine 
somewhere that other people won't have. Um, so they can have a nice one for Silverstone or somewhere further down the line when everyone else will be on a 40% engine, they might only have a 70% engine. That's so a it might be one. beneficial to them later down the line. And we've seen this before with Woods, who did a tactical double retirement at China to save an engine for later on. So, okay, it wasn't planned, but this may actually help them later on in the season. We'll, we'll wait to see. Yeah, take the pain now and see yeah. how <laughs> see how you end up uh, by the end of the year, I suppose. Um, some other people that anyone else didn't catch your eye, Casper, that particularly you would have expected or would have been particularly poor? Uh, not necessarily, but to be, uh, to be fair, uh, Horrell, right. Four out, of 60, uh, four out of six races this year did not finish. That's absolutely horrid. Uh, you could say no, it's horrible. Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! I feel so that bad. Was, that, that, was, that was that was oh. teed up, wasn't it? There, yeah. that was yeah. horrendous. Fair enough. That was as bad as his driving. Oh, <laughs> oh well, we, we're that's, harsh, that's harsh. I'll give you that, Ben. That's harsh. But nonetheless, but four out of six is is you know Shranku DNF standards, and he's been he got replaced for this race. Yeah, I mean, for uh, I mean, that's pretty much. Well, uh, at this point. Either he's going to have some problems with his team manager or he's uh, or he's going to have to work this out somehow and try to not DNF so much. I mean, particularly, I think, when you've got a teammate that is, you know, doing well, to be honest, Franchix had some good rounds. And like you say, they didn't have the engine really this time out. So to get out there in that eighth is, you know, you've got to be sort of trying to match your teammate, at least, haven't you, Ben? Yeah, it's not exactly a bad car, is it? Let's face it, it's a point-scoring car, and Horrell is just not showing that, it, you know, through DNFs, through not exactly, you know, good pace in what should be a, you know, a, an 8 to 10 place car, really. So oh, it, it must be said that that SRS is the second, for this round, was the second most developed car on the grid. Exactly. Only, only three points behind the VOD ball. Yeah. It, Granted, the engine wasn't there, but other than that, it's everything else pointed to. It's, it's a really good car, so yeah, he really needs to put his finger out. Um, otherwise, SRS need to get an, another driver simply that's actually going to score points and not retire. So, yeah. The other sort of elephant in the room, I suppose, Woods again. Mm. Uh, they they brought a few upgrades here. They upgraded the engine, and they qualified one car, and he did two laps, and never be seen again. And for what we're hearing, they've um. Both the guys have gone. They've, they've, yeah. they've left the, you know, left the boots, left the steering wheel, gone. See you, Ollie. Enjoy. I can't drive this. Uh, you know what? What? What's the thinking there? Is it literally? The, is it the team in the car? Or is it the mod? Is it? I don't know. It's, they've, it's, they've just not. They've they've been off. Let's be. They've been off pace most rounds. Reg has had some, you know, dragged it up there in mm. some ways. And I always thought it was the. The car, the car's gone in a very different direction to most. But then this time out, they put power on that car. And I thought, right, they're finally listening. They're moving forward like everyone else. We can see a turnaround for Woods. They didn't even give it a chance here, realistically. I I think, oh, I've been open in saying oh, I'm good friends with the guys at Woods. Um, I do a lot of work with Trinity, and they're both very good friends of mine. Um, and I think the general consensus was, when they got to Canada, saw how far they were off. They just didn't find it fun anymore. And it's, it's something I've done this season uh, with Super Cup. I didn't really enjoy the car, and I decided, you know what, I I don't find this fun. I'll I'll stop racing. And that's that's the general consensus really with both Woods guys. Uh, Redshaw did a few laps in practice and decided, you know what, I'm not enjoying this, and, and went. Uh, fair play to Thomas Jacobs. He you know gave it a good go in qualifying. Tried to give it a few laps. Got uh, the um, caught him some contact, I think, uh, on the first lap, and went. You know what? I'm not enjoying this either. Um, and it's 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 been a long running thing. It's uh, I know they haven't really enjoyed the the car. Been quite vocal about uh, some of the organisation and previous sort of admin actions as well. Um, and and I guess the question now is, what, where do Woods go from here? Because you're suddenly faced two weeks before the next race, and you've got no drivers. You know that's not good. Well, yeah, I mean, Casper, where where do we go from here? You know, we've got Hollywood's there with his team, and it's one of the longest serving, if not the longest, they're the maybe? longest, I think, the longest serving Super League team 
now with how many drivers? We don't know about the, the test driver, Chilgin. I assume he's probably gone as well in the honesty. They seem to come as a package, but he might he might jump in maybe if, if persuaded nicely and bought chocolate or something. <laughs> but in the meantime, um, where, where do you head for there? If you're mid-season now, it's not even the summer break where you've got four weeks where to find somebody. You've got two rounds still to go before then. Um, yes, we can find emergency people. Where, where would you start looking, Casper? Uh, I'd say look Super Cup. I mean, that's the obvious place to look, isn't it? Uh, the feeder series. I mean, that is the only place you could, unless you found, you have some contacts uh, with some people. I mean, that's probably the most obvious place to look at this point and try to find drivers, try to maybe uh, bring them in because this is an em- basically an emergency situation anyway. To counter that though, um, the the problem is we're, we're a significant way into the season now where a lot of Super Cup drivers decided, right, I want to fight for the title or I want to complete the season. And they may not necessarily want to move up. You know, they, they've committed so much time, practice, research into Super Cup that maybe they, they won't be willing to give up whatever championship they've, you know, fought for in Super Cup, move up to Super League where they've got to start from zero points. Yeah, in, that's true. In a not very good car towards the back of the field. It's, you know, it's not. It's not the greatest advertisement for a Super League drive, shall we say. Maybe a Formula Challenge driver then. There's always a possibility, you know? Yeah, if, if the right talent is there that would be able... Um, well, I guess you, you can't really be too picky now in the situation, but obviously you want someone who's no. going to be responsible, I think, is the key uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, I think, I think though, as you say, Ben, though, the people that, the people that you would want from the lower leagues are the, sort of the top guys of those series, you know, the people with speed but they won't want to leave those series because exactly. they're doing well in that series. So you end up having to go down to people that are either inconsistent or you end up with people that are just solid just to get you on yeah. the grid and keep you going. You know, it's, it's, it's never great finding people mid-season. I've had to do it myself every season so far. <laughs> and it's a it pain. Yeah, it's... It's, it's horrible to do. I, end up, I mean, I, this is where you end up with teams like last year we saw, was it Hawkeye and mm. Walters with like 11 drivers across the season? Uh, each, I mean, it's just madness. Uh, yeah. But whereas Woods has traditionally been, I've got two drivers. These are my drivers, near enough. You know, mm-hmm. I reserve here and there. It, Ollie finds himself in an interesting predicament, probably there. But I'm sure he'll pull something around. He's an experienced guy. Um, yeah. And I'm sure we'll see two Woods cars at the next race. Um, I think you probably have to go with. Well, yes, they may not get something out of this year, but you almost need to entice somebody going. We're building a team together for this season, and look at 2018. Exactly, but I think that's where they have to. Team for that. They have to go from that now, and just to say before we move on, it would be, you know, pretty devastating if Woods were to leave it. As a team with so much history, um, so much passion, I guess, in in that they are a team full of history, full of culture. You know, it's. I don't think it would really feel like Super League without Woods because they've been there for so long, and of course they're an engine manufacturer as well with Trinity. And that's going to be knock-on effects to Green Stripes or well, their customer as well. So, yeah, let's, let's hope they can stay on the grid. Well, absolutely, yeah. Where, where would the bucket blue be without Woods? Come on, that's what they're known for, <laughs> isn't Hashtag it? bucket filled. <laughs> um, talking of, as you quickly went on there to uh, to Green Stripes, their supplier, massive shout-out to Ger- uh, Gerrit Javis, who yep. finished the race 14th, their best finish this season with two points, which is incredible itself, and doubled that team's points for the season <laughs> in one round. Um, you know, but he's, he came from FC. And actually, that, when we were talking about, yeah, right, well, he's not set the world alight, and that car's okay, but like, he's, he's reliable. He's getting there. He finished, all right, three laps down, but he finished and got points. That's, they add up, and that's what you're going to need somebody to do. That, that's thing. what Woods need. They need someone who can just turn up every race, put in a decent amount of practice, who isn't going to crash into someone else who is safe and responsible in the car and who can pick up the points when other people falter. You know, we, we've seen quite high attrition rates this season to the point where maybe it's only 16 cars finishing or 15 cars finishing, at which point it's highly likely you're going to get a point. Um, and that, that, that's what unless, they need. Unless your name's Willis. Unless your name's me and you end up 16th, but, you know, we'll, we'll move over that. <laughs> uh, but that. But that's what you need. You need someone stable who's going to be there at the end and pick up whatever's left and this round, that was two points, and that's really good for GSR. Remember, all these points add up to money as well for the team, and it helps them develop, yep. and it just helped, you know. But they did only have one car on the grid, so that's not a good yeah. sign for from them as well. Um, 
you know, you start looking at that going, that's not great for Trinity either and Woods and that whole area. To, you know, I don't know if they work together, but, you know, you'd hope maybe at this point they might well do. Um, but, but we're looking at that sort of how teams are run and everything else going on that way. Well, on that, uh, Ben, you'd notice something that's gone on since the race, actually. Um, and as, uh, you know, looking a bit interesting, you, you love your contract situation. You saw that with Storm. Uh, what else have you noticed this time? I, I do love looking into all the contract stuff. Um, what I've noticed since is that Red Archer now seemingly only have uh, right kilk under contract, and that's on an emergency only. So this suggests that something's happened to Thomas Hintz, possibly, um, because his contract has suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth, and they don't have uh, another replacement primary yet for the original uh, person in the Red Archer. So... Yeah, interesting times coming to Silverstone for that one. Um, I hope maybe it's just a blip. Maybe it was accidentally I don't know cancelled or something, and they'll resign it. Or is this a sign that Hints is done with Super League and he's off? Who knows? We will we'll see at Silverstone. Well, I'm reliably informed oh. through my contacts. Oh, I actually, I know. I tell you, what, LinkedIn, <laughs> there, mate, LinkedIn. Um, the, the Red Archer have actually done this on purpose. So they've actually been very clever with this. It's actually very, very well managed, and I'm kind of, you know, kicking myself. I didn't realise it last year. You, because of the way the contract system has changed, and you can pick what date you want to do the contracts to, regardless. Now you don't have to pick a whole season or anything like that. They haven't. So when they signed these drivers, even on primary, they did them for like four months or three months or whatever it may be, because they know the attrition rate of drivers is potentially there. You're not paying as big a signing on fee and as big a wages if they leave. So okay. they already saved money when Benningfield left earlier in the season. Right. Yep. They effectively didn't pay up as much because they hadn't contracts in the whole season. Same with, and so, I mean, it doesn't, if I was a driver, it wouldn't instill confidence in me if you go, well, here's a three month contract. But at the same time, it's quite good business. Um, the only downside to it, <clears throat> I suppose, is if you get someone like Hins, who hopefully will see out the season, you end up re signing him two or three times during the season. And paying that fee, that signing on fee. Um, so there is a, you know, it can work both ways. If you think your drivers are a little bit, if, particularly if you're gambling on people and they might not stick around, it's quite a viable option, I think. Yeah. Um, and quite a clever way to get around the contract system, actually, where you might only want people as a reserve. Effectively, you're putting them as a reserve by only contracting them potentially for the race span of four races anyway, yeah, as, a, which- as a primary. Yeah, what you can also do is at that point you can see if they're if, uh, at the beginning of a season like this. I think I think yeah, you're right. It was a smart move in seeing them out. But now what they can do is sign Hins until the end of the season as well if they feel like he is definitely going to be there. And uh, yeah, they you know they'll have to pay the sign on fee again. But the risk was that he could have, uh, for all we know, he could have retired of three races, and then the, uh, in that case they would have saved money as you know Benefield did. So, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, it's nearly smarter to just do that and sign on uh, and sign them on for the remainder of the season uh, after you're sure that they're there and uh, prepared to commit. Having worked with, with Red Archer now for a couple of years on, with the engines and stuff, that team is run so well. It, it's by far one of the best managed teams on the whole grid. But he has such bad luck with keeping drivers. I don't, it's unbelievable how many he went through. Even his, I mean... What was it? He started off with Canapino and Benefield at the start of the season. Canapino didn't even turn a wheel, I don't think. He then moved into... Who else did he move into? He's gone through loads this season already. Yeah. And, and it was the same last season. It's just He's just so unlucky. <laughs> and if he ever gets two drivers together that stick out the whole season and they're decent enough, that team can be up there again for the championship because it's just it's so well run. And the team is... At, you know, the car's up there. It, you know, they're saving money on little bits of contracts like that that no one else is thinking of doing. Um it's impressive stuff, I must be said. But that's that's the sort of thing you don't necessarily see behind the scenes when you're watching the racing. You look at it and go, actually, yes, they've done very well, and they move the car, and they're getting double points finishes. But it's no it's no small thing getting a double points finish in Super League. It really isn't. So uh, we, that's basically moving on to Silverstone, really, next time out, isn't it? Um, so we've spoken a little bit about certain penalties and bits and pieces like that. Um, we should, as you said, Ben, see plenty of upgrades coming for the next round because it was only a handful. We probably won't see anything from... Vobble, Red Archer, and Storm. We might see something from everybody else. We should see something from near enough everybody else. Um, 
engine wise, we probably should only see something from Talos because they upgraded to Monaco. Yeah. Um, what are we thinking though for things like tires and who are we expecting to be right up there? Um. Well, we really expect uh, upgrades in Norton, Walters, so they should really be up there. Um, a Talos engine upgrade could help Hawkeye move up a bit as well. They obviously had a bit of bad luck the last few races, so they'll be looking to bounce back strong. Um, tires is going to be really interesting because. I could see a valid use for mediums, maybe. I don't, um, know. I don't know what Casper thinks. Casper <laughs> wakes up, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't. I don't think we'll see the three softest compounds. I, I think so, at least someone will gamble with a medium. Maybe Street Fighter again. Maybe Red Archer. Except if there are no hard tires. <laughs> I did say hard tires this time. Just said me. Yeah. Uh huh. But, <laughs> no, yeah. uh, I, I'd say actually, to be fair, some uh, at least a couple things that will try uh, medium tires. If someone tries hard tires, I will. I, I I think I will really want to see that because that yeah. that will be a failure and a half. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh. I think if it, if it works, then we have to stand up and applaud that one. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't think we'll see it. I'm to try it now, just for you, Casper. I oh, need my it. words. Do it. <laughs> uh, my drivers would kill me. I think if I just went. Yeah, yeah you've got hard tires. Good luck. <laughs> But yeah. having said that, it could be, you know, mediums and stuff, like you say, could be a very viable option for certain people, particularly uh, particularly people that aren't necessarily in the title hunt. It's always worth going off, you know, off strategy. We've praised people like Street Fighter in the past for trying it. Yeah. You've got, it's worth a gamble. If it doesn't work, then are you any worse off, really, sometimes? It, you know, particularly, like you say, if the attrition rate's up, you know, you're getting, basically, if you finish, you're getting the points anyway. What's, you know, if you were only going to get there anyway, you might as well gamble and see if you can get into the higher reaches. It's worth a go. Yeah, it's worth a gamble from one of the small teams. Okay, it may not work, um, but Silverstone is a very high tight deck track. So many long, fast, flowing corners that, who knows, Ultras may turn out to only last like three or four laps, in which case you're doing ten pit stops or something. So, um, yeah, there may be the chance for mediums to work here. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what teams do. I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, ultra softs are so uh, would be so soft that they couldn't actually last through maggots and beckets and yeah. literally, literally went off and grip by the end, and you couldn't even do a quality lap. I wouldn't be surprised if that happened, to be honest. I I agree, actually. I think quality could be really interesting, and I think people who quality on a super soft may be better off because the ultra soft may actually not last that for one lap and fall off towards the end. But who knows? Wow, we'll see. That's, that's quite a bold. So, you know, to see people. Failing at the end of a lap is going to be exciting. Pit crews could be working a plenty again at <laughs> Silverstone. Um, so I do, yeah, it might be worth covering that at some point. What you know, the pit crew upgrades and stuff because we have seen a little bit. It didn't really mention it here. We have seen things like you know Morris doing an awful lot of pit stops and stuff, and they've got one of the worst pit crews on the grid. Bar Woods who haven't done it at all. Um, but you know, other than that, they can that can make a difference as well that you don't even see on track. Uh, all these little bits that go on with the teams. Um, I think, lads, we're probably there. I mean, uh, uh, quickly go through the standings for you, just so that um, you know where we're at now. Uh, come the end of round seven, moving into Silver. So our top five currently sits with Van Buren at the top uh, with 145 points. Morris sits with 102. Closely followed by Baldy with 99. Uh, Cap it on 97. Fidek on 79 in fifth. It's very close still there uh, at the top, really. It's not that far away. Bar Van Buren, who's a little bit ahead. Everyone else is very close together. Um, so that's going to be exciting going into the round. Uh, like I say, Silverstone uh, is only a week away now. Uh, so you can tune into that on GPWC's YouTube. But you can also catch uh, Ben, Casper, and maybe me. Hopefully Jake. Please come back, Jake. Um, <laughs> a week later. Please, please uh, come back. <laughs> please, I'm getting bullied by these lads. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we're... Uh, the show will be back anyway with somebody sitting in the seat and with Ben and Casper, no doubt, uh, the week after on the Thursday, uh, which will be the 14th. Um, and we've got a uh, few shows, though, coming up here on Sim News. We've also got uh, we've got Parker's Pit Stop coming up as well. We've got myself back as a scrutineer. So even if I'm not on the SL show, you can catch me anyway next week, uh, the night before the race on the Wednesday, 10 you and you need to know about it. Um and that's basically it for some news. There's an awful lot coming up. Make sure you subscribe below and you can't miss a thing. I want to thank uh, Ben and Casper for joining me. Thank you very much, lads. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I shall see you all very soon. Ciao for now. Bye.